Hey everyone, my name is Joshua Ernie and welcome to Mule Made Easy. This video is part of a series that me and my friend Jose Montoya are creating. The goal of this series is to get you up to date on some of the cool features in Mule 4 and discuss some of the changes since Mule 3. So if that's something that interests you, feel free to subscribe. Today I'll be discussing the Mule 4 message. Let's get to it. So this is an overview of what we'll be discussing in this video. We're going to be talking about the similarities and differences between the new Mule 4 message and the previous Mule 3 message. We're going to use a code example to demonstrate how to work with the Mule 4 message. We'll discuss how you'll need to think differently about the new Mule 4 message than you did in the past with Mule 3. And we'll just briefly discuss my thoughts on the changes. This is the Mule 3 message object. This should look pretty familiar to you if you've worked with Mule 3 before. Within the object we have the message, which contains a header, which contains inbound properties and outbound properties, and within the message as well is the payload. Now the inbound properties are immutable, meaning that you can't change them once they get set, and they get set by whatever inbound connector was most recently triggered. The outbound properties are mutable and those properties will go into whatever kind of outbound connector that you might have. So you might use the outbound properties to set some HTTP headers, um, uh, JMS headers, things of that like. The payload, you should already be familiar with it, it contains the payload for the message. On the right hand side here you see variables which obviously just store your variables, your attachments for things like attaching um, files to HTTP responses and email, for example, and your exception payload as well. So taking a look at the Mule 4 message structure, you can see that it's a lot more simple and slimmed down than the Mule 3 message structure. Within the Mule event, we have the message, which contains attributes, which are also immutable, just like inbound properties for the Mule 3 message. You'll notice that outbound properties are gone and we still have our payload. On the right side here, you'll notice that we only have variables and that attachments in the exception payload are gone as well. There are a few things that you can't see by looking at the diagrams of the mule messages that I had put together. The first thing is that in mule 4, the mule message is now immutable, meaning that just like for inbound properties, this message or this object rather, cannot be directly changed by another piece of code. The collection of messages is now a mule message with a list of mule messages as the payload in mule 4. And this is in contrast to mule 3, where this kind of collection of messages was represented as a mule message collection object. And finally, the attributes for mule 4 message, which were previously inbound properties in the mule 3 message, are now strongly typed. And this winds up being great for data sense. Now, if you're anything like me, you're getting sick of looking at these PowerPoint slides, so let's get into some code. Alright, so the previous slides and diagrams were fine for describing how the mule message has changed in mule 4 from mule 3, but you're probably asking yourself, how is this going to change? my programs and the way that I code. How do I get access to the message as a whole, the message attributes, or the payload, for example? It turns out that this is very simple and almost identical to the way that we did it in Mule 3, with the exception of attributes, obviously, because they fall under a completely different name. So let's check that out real quick. My first logger, we have the message. And just like we did in Mule 3, we call the, um, we use the pound sign and square brackets and just call message uh, within those. Just keep in mind that this is actually data weave code that is executing and it's no longer MEL or the mule expression, mule expression language. Now if we go to the last one here, this is how we get access to the payload just like we did in mule 3 and you can probably guess it when we need access to attributes we just call attributes directly like that. And if you wanted to get access to specific attributes, what you would do is you can just use the dot notation and you'll get a list of valid attributes. And you'll notice that these all correspond to the event source, in this case, an HTTP listener. So this is mule made easy tip number one. 
all your attributes at any point in your flow are going to correspond directly to the most recent event source. In this case, it's HTTP. So we have things like listener path, query, query string, request URI, method, etc. All right, let's go ahead and delete that and we'll start running some code. So I've already went ahead and deployed this app. Let's go ahead and take a look at what it does. We already know that we're logging the message here, logging the attributes here, and logging the payload here at the end. Let's take a look in the set payload component, or excuse me, the transform message component. And you'll see that I'm doing an output JSON and just setting it as a JSON object with the key name and the value Miles Davis. And here I have an HTTP listener that's just listening on the message path. So if I pull up my postman over here, I'll just send this off real quick. You'll see I get back the message name Miles Davis, which is great. That's exactly what we wanted. So let's go ahead and check out the console so we can see what what happens when we log things like the message and the attributes. So the first entry here, I'll go ahead and maximize this so we can see the whole thing. In the first entry here, I was logging the message. So the message is, and you'll see everything that has to do with the message right here. We have our payload um, and our attributes as well, all contained within the message as a whole. If you look here at the second log entry, which starts right here, this is where we're logging the attributes and you can see here like I was talking about earlier these attributes are strongly typed they're of type HTTP request attributes and you'll see this type change depending if you're doing a database call or you're receiving something from a JMS queue or and depends on what kind of event source you're using really and if you look at the very bottom here at this last log entry this is where I'm logging the payload and that's just that object that we had, uh, name equals Miles, our name is set to Miles <laughs> Davis. Let's go ahead and minimize this real quick because I want to point out something that's particularly important to think about when you're dealing with um, the meal 4 message as opposed to meal 3. And that's where do you set outbound properties? Outbound properties are gone. So we need some kind of way to set HTTP headers or JMS headers and things of the like. And it turns out you just do it directly on the component or the connector itself. So what we do here is let's say, let's say we collect some information and we want to set the outbound or set the header of the HTTP response. We want to set a genre to jazz. The way we typically do this, and this is Mule Made Easy tip number two, is when you are trying to set outbound properties for a particular connector, the way you should collect those is through variables. So what we're gonna do here is just set this variable, we're gonna call the variable genre, and we're gonna set the value equal to jazz. Now, in order to make sure that that header appears in the HTTP response, what we need to do is double click on this listener and in this tab right here, responses, click on that and you'll see you have the header section right here for our typical body. So we'll add, we'll hit plus right there. We'll set this equal to genre and the value as vars.genre. We'll save this and this should go ahead and reload real quick. We'll pull up Postman one more time, and we'll call this, and let's check out our headers. There we have it. Genre Jazz got set as the header. So just remember that when you are when you need to set outbound attributes on something, whether it's you know JMS headers or HTTP headers, you're going to need to do it directly on the connector now instead of doing it um, through outbound properties. So in conclusion, we talked about the similarities and differences between the Mule Four and Mule Three message. We went over some code examples for the Mule 4 message showing things like how you could access attributes, the message, and the payload. Uh, we talked about how to think about the Mule 4 message versus the Mule 3 message. And as far as my thoughts on the change, I really like how they simplified this design and I like how they put they took the attachments out of the message. I like that because attachments are only applicable to some connectors. And the same thing applies to 
things that were outbound properties in Mule 3. For example, HTTP has outbound headers and uh, JMS has headers, but things like database don't really have them, so they're not necessary in that case. So I like how they I like how they separated those concerns. And don't forget about the Mule Made Easy tips that we discussed through the video. The first one, message attributes are determined by their most recent event source. And the second one, to set HTTP headers, JMS headers, etc., we do so directly on the connector, just like I was talking about earlier. And if you need to collect these throughout the flow, the best way to do that is in a variable. So that wraps up uh, the Mule Made Easy video for the Mule 4 message. If you like the video, like the video. If you'd like to see more content like this in the future, subscribe and look out for my friend Jose Montoya's video on Mule 4 error handling. It should be releasing on Wednesday. Thanks.